Awesome. Thank you very much for, for coming out today and, uh, you know, getting to hear a little bit about uh, securing the software. Uh, let me do a couple of really quick introductions. We've got a really great panel today for you guys. Um, Murdu Uchil is the India site leader and senior director for cybersecurity for Visa. She has an incredibly deep background in design and architecture products covering identity access management, security, cloud, mobile infrastructure, you know, with products in the, in the SaaS and PaaS offerings. Um, to my right, I also have Harish Gohl, who's the director of IT security and compliance for our Publis Group, and is a huge global organization. He leads the IT SOC, NOC, and security initiatives and responsible for securing the organization's environment for internal and external attacks and breaches. A very serious job. And Abhishek Dada is the senior engineering manager over at Chargebee, leading multiple teams in development of identity access management platform, microservices framework security, and DevSecOps initiatives. And of course, you know me, uh, Matthew Bonney. I'm the VP and Chief Product Security Officer at Honeywell. You know, I, I lead a team of global cybersecurity experts who spend their day and nights, you know, protecting the software that we make. So. Our panel today brings together, you know, a lot of key industry leaders to discuss the challenges of best practices for developing software securely, right? It's not a trivial exercise and it is quite different than perhaps, you know, what most people see as sort of IT security or OT security. And, you know, hopefully everybody's going to be able to walk away from today's discussion with some insights on how maybe they can enhance their own sustainable, secure software development lifecycle. So with that, let's jump right in. So Harish, why is software security so important? Okay, so uh, we all live in a digital era right now. So we all know like, okay, software is used everywhere. So everything is software driven right now. So the shoes we wear and the system we use and the IOTs, everything is the software. So security is must, like it is a need of the hour for the secure software. It is not an option anymore. So let's take an example, like, okay, we have a kids in our homes. So we teach them, we train them before we send them out of the home. So same way, like softwares, we have to secure them once we are developing before putting them into the productions. So this is very important that yes, software security is nowadays is very important for every organization. Great point. So Murdu, for software companies, which comes first? You know, security or the software? Hi Matt. I think my voice is loud. Okay, is this better guys? Okay. So first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to see so much overwhelming participation, not just this session, but I think overall uh, Nalcon. So thank you so much. Hopefully this is a session where you'll be all awake after lunch. So to answer your question uh, between software and security, in my opinion, both go very hand in hand. Both entities are required. They're like integral part of the system. And why so? Because today, uh, in today's era, cyber attacks are over, um, you know, uh, increasing all the time. And exploiting the security vulnerability in any software has become the very significant target for all hackers. Because once you exploit any software, all the users of the software, applications that consume the software, everything, it goes in the exponential attack, it's like a catastrophic. And in that range, it can exploit right from changing a device to bot to a DDoS or a CV. And that's the reason security is integral part of the software. You cannot separate both. Now, coming back to your SDLC question. So SDLC has been there uh, ever since software is there. But I just want to connect the thread to our uh, keynote topic, which was very good. Uh, learning from past, acting in play present and going for future, how do you prepare yourself, right? So going from reactive to proactive approach. So even same the case should be for SDLC. Our SDLC should evolve to the next gen and it should be right from requirement to your deployment. So when you start designing, architecting your product right there, threat model, uh, look at the attack surface, what is your ingress, egress and what could be the attack surface open 
that is first then you when you write code secure coding guidelines is very important i'm going to take quick three examples uh, which came in the keynote very easy but very important uh, input data validation or sanitization then uh, for cross cross site scripting right it's very easy to set cookies same site cookies very simple things but i think that should be in the mindset when you write the code itself and the sqli which is very uh, you know popular uh, vulnerability so never never write queries which is exposing data right from your db always use stored procedures or you know wrappers so things like that so when you write code in that way uh, that is taking your mind to the security or you know not even creating vulnerabilities forget about fixing it now coming to the next event of sdlc which is your sas and dash utilize uh, all the industry leading tools i think we have many check marks uh, codacy or microfocus uh, synopsis so always use those tools which are uh, proven in industry and also focus on things which are not done in the past things like when you use tools there are a lot of false positives and there are no recommendations given how to fix it so work on things where you can customize those tools don't just use the tools now check marks gives a lot of ability to customize it you can customize right query so that you can reduce the false positives so those things like that even dash when you use dash don't, don't just keep to the uh, stage where you are writing the dash queries or simulation and then not looking at the industry what is changing so continuous evolu evolution and the last one is open source scan and the third party scan which we use vera code so this is the entire life cycle which you should implement at every stage of the sdlc there has to be security uh, practices implementation great great point so it's it's understanding that it's through the whole life cycle and using your your tool chain effectively and correctly through that whole whole life cycle so i got a question for everybody so we we often think about you know building secure applications and you know we all have sort of our own little bit of recipes our own little tricks you know, what are your top one or two application security best practices? And you know, what's your recipe? Why don't you start off with uh, Abhishek? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, from my point of view, like uh, one is the most important about the privilege access. Like we should have a limit access. I'm not saying, okay, we should restrict the access to the developers on the repositories, online repositories and the stuff, but we should have some kind of a uh, limit access so that we can uh, prevent some kind of attacks here and second is about the continuous efforts in terms of the code what we are writing the developers are writing for the analysis of the codes and the testing because right now like we are uh, into the ci cd pipelines we use it so that continuous efforts of analysis and testing is more important so these are the two things i can say and i want other panelists to add on okay i'll quickly add on it so just extension to SD, uh, SDLC, I think you should have a very mature security assessment pipeline in terms of um, making sure all key controls are scanned. And we comply as a cybersecurity program or a company, you comply to a lot of standards like NIST and so on. So make sure right from architecture, SSDLC, your ethical hacking or mobile and bug bounty, white hat. So there are so many key controls that you should scan. And nowadays, again, the change should happen, right? There shouldn't be only scanning. There should be automation. So all this scanning, uh, the workflow should be automated, integrated, good enough. And the last one I would mo I want to mention is the cloud strategy. Quickly, I think we have a separate question on that as well. But depending upon your workload and payload in the company, a sensitivity of the transaction, criticality of the security, you should decide on the hybrid model versus public or private. What goes in public, what stays in private, uh, depends on your company uh, security strategies and the business that you are in. Let's say for fintech, when you handle a lot of PI information, you cannot have all your workload in the public cloud. Because though uh, everybody knows about the advantages of the public cloud, there are still things to be worked upon in terms of security, control, logging. Uh, and since cloud is known to everyone, it is prone to DDoS more than your private one. So I think things like that should be part of your recipe. So what was the question again? How? What are the tips and tricks for? What, what are the top there? application security best practices okay. from your experience? Okay. 
So I'll probably talk a bit on the, maybe on the engineering side of things. Just like uh, if you're managing infrastructure, you would probably not want your secrets to be spread across different people in the organization, right? So if you're a security architect, how about think of not, you know, spreading across security validation, like input validation across every single developer. How about build systems which will automatically validate input before the business logic is invoked? Right. So you will have one single place for your security team to audit that all the validations are defined or not. If it is not defined, it is a validation. As a security team, you don't have to look at 100 different applications. You will just look at one place. You will see that input validation is there. I'll give an example like uh, what I have seen in real life, right? What a lot of organizations follow. See, for example, if you're an organization which has recently or maybe in the past adopted API first development, right? You define specs, maybe API specs, or for any kind of software engineering, you'll probably start with specs. How about adopt defining validation criteria as part of the specs itself and generate code with input validation baked into it? Like, I'll give you an example. You can have, if you use open API uh, for as the specification for defining your APIs, you can have open API uh, annotations to define input validation for at your spec level. And from there, when you generate the code, that code by default implements all kind of input validation that you have defined in the spec. So imagine what happens, the benefit. You, from a security perspective, you don't need to go and look into 100 different source code to see whether the input validations are done correctly or not. You look at the spec, you see input validations, input validation constraints are defined. All the validators are at, the single, as a, at a single source of truth. The validation logic is generated, so you can have trust from your security architecture perspective, that input validation will be performed. So this is just one aspect of it. So the overall point is that why not build system that are inherently secure so that, you know, the security decisions and security logic is not spread across various parts of the code or the infrastructure. Great point. Great point. And, and I'll just close that comment up with one of the things that I find that's a real easy takeaway is as you build your programs, create simple minimum requirements for all that, that all software must perform, right? Start with a minimum set of things that you want. We were talking about the FCLC, talking about threat modeling and open source scanning. Put it in simple enough terms, English terms, terms that are that your leadership will understand. And if you create minimums that are anyone can understand, your 16-year-old daughter can understand, then it makes it super easy to get buy-in from leadership. Because when people don't perform them, people ask questions. But if you leave it in a technical jargon in your minimums and your articulation of how the minimums are done, then it makes it very hard for leaders who you're really the people you want to, to enforce these things on the development community, they won't understand them or they'll need additional understanding or additional education. But by simply using simple terms, clarifying what your minimums are, and then ubiquitously rolling it out across your entire organization, it becomes much easier to consume and apply. So moving on to their next question. So Amashek, you know, securing cloud has been a real struggle. I mean, we heard today at a number of sessions around cloud yesterday, there were some great discussions about cloud. You know, what are the top three mistakes you see that developers make and, and, and how do you combat them? Okay. So, so from my perspective, what I have seen, one of the biggest mistake is, uh, you know, not managing secrets or privileged access in the cloud properly. But I'll probably break it down into a bit more generic based on my experience. So uh, what I have seen is that if you're starting a new company or if you're adopting cloud, many times what happens is that you start with probably a few cloud accounts which are meant for your production and run produce. And then you end up creating a whole bunch of accounts for say testing purpose, for POC environments, for different teams, right? Then later when you revisit and you see that you want to probably have a cloud governance and cloud security program implemented, you certainly have multiple uh, multiple uh, cloud accounts laying around here and there and you don't know what to do about it, right? 
So then you have to probably get them towards an organization, adopt uh, in AWS language, service control policies, adopt policies across. So first point is, uh, from my perspective, bringing this account governance is probably the fundamentals of getting started with a public crowd, right? Subsequently, as uh, most of us have seen, traditional vulnerabilities will not be relevant for cloud managed services. For example, consider AWS ALB. Even though AWS ALB was probably vulnerable to this uh, desync, HTTP desync attack, but general NGNX vulnerabilities or exploits will probably not work against ALB, right? But many a times the most common vulnerabilities or flaws that we see in the cloud is misconfiguration. Mm -hmm. Not being able to leverage the identity and access management capability provided by the PaaS, the cloud platform itself, effectively. Even I have also made the mistake, like for example, for even for null null community, many of you may know that we uh, host uh, some part of null websites in AWS. They had created, initially days, we have created policies with lots of uh, needless permissions attached, right? So these are some of the problems uh, that we need to look at, that uh, whenever you, you follow principle of least privilege, whenever you provision or use any kind of cloud resources, have a, as a security architect or security profession, professional, have very good understanding of the identity and access management capability of the underlying platform and see how we can enforce principle of least privilege whenever you are adopting any services. And third, again, as I mentioned, secrets management. How, how, how do you handle that? Right, So you need to have POC accounts for your developers. You need to give access to various cloud environments to your developers. How do you provision that? For production or other environments, how do you provide access to various applications, to various resources, right? Follow IMDS or instance-based instance, instance -based, uh, permissions. Don't provide, uh, you know, a secret access, uh, uh, I mean, provision credentials. Use the capabilities of the cloud for provisioning access. I, I would say these are some of the best practices. Great, great points. Excellent. So uh, I want to sort of shift gears a little bit. And, you know, we've heard so many challenges over the last, you know, especially the last 12, 18 months about, you know, um, securing software and the issues that, come with uh, attacks coming from you know, supply chain and other areas. You know, um, how should companies protect the integrity of their development environments? I want everybody, but Maruda, yeah, go ahead. Why don't you start us off? Okay, so I think everybody has heard about zero trust architecture. It's not an architecture. So to answer your question, Matt, what every company should do to have the integrity of their dev environment, I think this is the time where everybody has to jump onto zero trust philosophy. I think last two years of pandemic has taught us that we cannot trust any external versus internal network as such. So I'll just a little bit go over the building blocks of zero trust philosophy. And again, it's a philosophy. It's not one single architecture or technology. Uh, right from, uh, you know, earlier we used to first trust and then verify. Now first we verify and we trust. So that is a first foundational principle for zero trust. You trust no one unless you verify. Um, and every network is hostile. That is what that has taught us. There is nothing like internal network is secure and external network is not secure because both networks are prone for attacks and hacks. Uh, you authenticate every entity, every user, network, device that is interacting with the system. So that is where you verify each and every uh, entity. Authentication. I think IAM technologies have evolved to uh, starting with least privilege or just in time privilege. So you give access rights or privilege just for the task that you're doing and just for the time that you want to do that task. So JIT and least privilege are coming into picture. Again, fine grain authorization. So give very, very fine grain authorization to each entity in the system, right from network to infra to app. So for the everything. developers. For the developers, yeah, yeah, yes, for yeah. the developers. Okay. Because you know, right, as there is a study that more than 50% of attacks are internal mm. uh, attacks, Fair. insider threats. So, right. yep, that. And then there is this continuous security efficiency, which is also part of zero trust. Now, you, you must have heard about the behavioral patterns, right? So every time you see an incident, every time, every time there is an attack or threat, we talked about threat intel, I think there was one session, so there has to be a closed feedback loop uh, from that to learn 
that behavioral pattern and feed that back into the system so that system becomes efficient every time the incident happens or attack happens so that continuous efficiency has to be there. Then uh, secure logging, monitoring, yeah, because that's part of the zero trust too. Yeah, yeah. So I think there are many, many building blocks as such and that should be the philosophy for everybody to, as Great. every organization to actually have for the integrity of their dev environments. Great. Harish, what do you think? Uh, from my point of view, the most important is the auditing part, which Mridul has mentioned about it. Like auditing is most important because you track the, your changes. So developers do a lot of changes in the environment. Might be they are using the on-prem on the online repositories to push their codes. So you know what changes they are doing, what uh, what versions they are using. And if in case of any problem or in case of any incident, you want to track back. Yes, you have all the auditing in place. So auditing is most important and we have a lot of proactive uh, tools in the market uh, which can do the proactively monitoring of uh, and which can maintain the integrity of the software as well. So Black Duck is one of the tools like, which is there in the market, uh, similar like there's so many years there. So these are the two stuff if you will maintain, then it's easy you guys like uh, to maintain the integrity and damn sure like you can take it out. Awesome. Abhishek, go ahead. Yeah, I'll probably be a bit uh, more specific. So uh, if you see after uh, this, what is this, where this Microsoft FireEye got compromised because of SolarWinds, right? So everyone everyone has started talking about supply chain security. It's actually very big. It's not just about libraries, bunch of things out there. But uh, if you're if you're looking if you look at this uh, OpenSSF initiative, Open Source Security Foundation initiative, they are actively trying to solve this problem, this major problem. This is a very difficult problem actually. It's not just about running SCA tools or knowing about third-party vulnerabilities. It's much bigger than that. One of the uh, one of the things which uh, OpenSSF is trying to solve is ensuring the integrity of software starting from source till it gets deployed and operated in an environment, right? Ultimately, you want your infrastructure, your environment where your applications are running to be trusted, right? You want to know what is running, is the exact same code which is built or not, right? There has been cases in the past where, say, you have your secure source code control repository, but your CI CD is compromised. CI CD is not protected. Jenkins, for example, Jenkins is well known that if, if you, if someone gets a user account in Jenkins, there is a high chance they will submit a malicious job and gain access to the CICD environment itself, right? So as part of this OpenSSF initiative, multiple tools are built in order to generate a manifest of every single build artifact, cryptographically sign those build artifact, gener generate provenance what is called provenance, right? So at the time of infrastructure provisioning, deploying this applications into a particular infrastructure, you can verify whether the artifact that you are deploying is actually the artifact which was built by a trusted build system or not, right? So maybe you can look at this uh, set of tools. There is also a framework called the SLS, is the, what is called the Salsa framework, right? Which right. actively talks about uh, the best practices and the you know the tooling that you should adopt in order to harden your application software supply chain. Great point. So for those you know, Salsa framework is is something that you definitely should take a look at if you're not familiar with it. So let's get into uh, the next question, Harish. So a lot of dev DevOps you know teams struggle with security. You know what kind of lessons can you share with implementing you know DevSecOps? Yeah, recently we have so many uh, like lessons there. Like uh, we all measured, most of us knows about the log4j vulnerabilities and the spring for shell. So these kind of vulnerabilities are there in the market. So let's just go into the deep dive into the log4j. So what was that? Like it's just the basic old vulnerability which was exploited yeah. by someone and put it on the cloud. And then it becomes a nightmare for all the cybersecurity defense professionals. So that's the great lesson for all the all those organizations which is still following the old methodology of DevOps, they are they are just trying to adopting or they are into the phase. Okay, they will. They are thinking that they will do it. Uh, they will add the security into the DevOps part, but they are not. So they have to think in that way. Okay, they they can add it. They can learn those lessons so that history should not be repeated and we should not have these kind of things. Uh, because what happens that when you you don't have the security in the development phase. So you are putting not your organizations, you are putting all those organizations which is going to use that software 
in the market later once into the production. So it, it is a very huge effort for all those organizations because low for the like thousand of applications was compromised. Nobody was knows, okay, where that application is that, what module they have to uh, patch it or fix it. And they have a lot of legacy also because mm -hmm. it was an old vulnerability exploited. They have a lot of dependency, so they can't fix it over the night. And still, till now also, they are the organizations which are still fixing out, trying to find out the alternative and workarounds. Okay, they have to work on the log4j or they have to fix it out. So it's a lesson definitely for all of us and for all those organizations who is working on that one to adopt that security into the DevOps part. Great, great points. So Abhishek, 80% of all the software out there has got open source. You've been talking about open source off and on yesterday and now today, even in our discussion. You know, you know, any lessons learned how to best manage open source risks? Yeah, so uh, I'll again probably share uh, my experience, what has worked for me at uh, the scale that I have seen. So uh, if you consider, as Matt mentioned, that 80% of software in any application comes from open source, right? So that means whatever risks are there, vulnerabilities are there in your application, in addition to that, you are inheriting the risks, the vulnerabilities from all the uh, third-party applications or third-party dependencies that you have, right? So for me, uh, if I'm starting a new project today, I would probably adopt tools like, say, dependency check or maybe commercial tools like Black Duck or Snick to start building a gate, security gate, right from day one, where you cannot ship an application with high or maybe critical vulnerabilities in third party dependencies, right? But that is probably not ideal. You'll probably, most of us have lots of uh, legacy applications or applications where we have not implemented the gates, right? In such case, uh, what has worked for me or what I would suggest from based on my experience is that probably we should start by implementing the detective control side of things. Adopt the same set of tools scan this application maybe as part of the CI or on a nightly basis, build some dashboard where it gives you a visibility of your software bill of materials across all your projects, all the vulnerabilities that you are inheriting by adopting those third party uh, libraries as well as maybe the licensing related things if that's relevant for you. What has worked for me also like showing this dashboard to the respective teams, maybe the engineering managers or the directors and have them take action just get their commitment that we will reduce or remove the only the critical and high risk vulnerabilities, right? So that is probably a stepping stone, stepping stone that will lead us to a baseline of hygiene as well as uh, drive a culture of shared security responsibility where the teams are responsible for, you know, the various teams are responsible for the security of their own software components, right? Once a certain baseline is reached that most of the applications do not have high or critical vulnerabilities in their third party dependency, that is a place where uh, we should probably bring in some preventive controls, which prevents introduction of new high and critical vulnerability so that this system or this bench baseline that you have achieved with some hard work is maintained, right? Otherwise, what will happen is that again, this will get polluted, new vulnerabilities yeah. will come in. Great point. Yeah, in managing your backlog is uh, is a big challenge if you don't already start some process to clean it up. So you know, uh, part of what we've been talking about is is really talking about and dealing with developers and and development communities. And one of the things that comes up a lot is about the resistance um, to form you know the cyber work at the right time. Or hey, I've got to get this delivered. You know, if it stows, it goes, and we got to. You know, we have to make this release this week, you know, and so it tends to have cybersecurity done at the last minute or sometimes being cut off. And, you know, to me, it, it goes back to around the accountability. A lot of what uh, accountability is dealt with today in most companies is at the developer level uh, around vulnerabilities. They don't think of it as it's a transactional activity. It's like, okay, Hey, you needed to do this task or you needed to perform this or, Hey, you've got six criticals in your, your process or your product, your software. And what I want you to think about is a slightly different view. And that is accountability for software isn't just your job. It's your boss's boss's boss all the way up to the owner of the company, right? Because at the end of the day, it's their product and 
if you think this way and build a culture of that, you actually will get a more universal adoption of, of cybersecurity in your company. One of the simplest ways is, is driving that accountability that so that the manager, the development managers and CTOs all understand that your work as a developer, they're responsible for it. And in, you know, a, a great example where, where I've come from is we have a program that we've established that says, Hey, the CTO signs off on every release of software. And when the CTO is the person signing off on the so software, you can be assured the developer is not going to hand up bad code. Well, they might do it once, but there's surely not going to be a second time. And, and it drives a level of maturity and it drives a level of diligence into the quality of software. And more importantly, it drives a whole cultural mindset of this is important. It's quality. It's part of what we should be delivering. So just think about that as you implement your own programs. How can you drive that accountability further up into the organization? So I uh, want to jump into Murdu from one vendor to another. Let's jump into software supply chain risk. How would you combat that? Yeah, so I think some of the points Abhishek already mentioned, so I'll try to have some additional one. So everybody's aware of today's software supply chain, right? Uh, when you build any software, there are a lot of dependencies because not everything you have in your control, right? From infrastructure, there are binaries, then you have uh, third party, open source, as well as I think uh, build tools and so on. So the code that you write, it depends on a lot of things in the in the ecosystem and that's where the chain supply chain comes and because you have many components and dependencies of, of course there is a risk because if any component goes rogue or every any component is exploited the entire chain is is exploited and we have seen the example i think the one which abhishek mentioned solar winds right because if that was exploited all the organizations using that tool got ex um, actually at a risk now, how to combat that? So three points I was thinking about. Um, one, definitely there has to be a continuous open source or third party library scanning that you should have in your organization. Uh, and we should not wait for external researchers to come back with the CV now, because that is the case right now. It's a very reactive approach unless, and we saw the example in Log4j, Spring4 shell all of these examples we saw and they were like a foundational libraries in your code only when external researchers um, showed those cv i think everybody got is a turmoil for everyone to fix it that should not be the case i think that's a very reactive approach so there has to be a frequent frequency based kind of a scan in your system where you can look at all these uh, different systems or sites we have mitre is one a lot of industry based tools where they continuously look at the industry patterns and cyber attacks and they have that data what is exploitable in the uh, industry what are the new attack vectors so learn from that have the pointers from that and evolve your own scanning program with DAST where you implement those simulations and start scanning all the open source libraries in your ecosystem, in your company. So before external researchers can come back with the CV, you have some idea, you can come, you basically will find out some exploitation in, in your system. So that is one. Second, we talked about dependency. Right? How do we know the dependency tracker? So nowadays, uh, all the tools, say Sona type is one where it gives you the complete S bomb, the software bill of material. So complete uh, dependency checks and tracker of the binary that you're using. So you know where it can go wrong and what you have to sanitize. So use that. And the third one is integrity of the um, entities that you use and that goes right from if you're using container the image of the container which is like a self-contained application from the uh, from that to the binary and uh, to any any artifact that you could have right so make sure all the artifacts right from the assessment is done and you're ready to deploy how you can make sure the integrity of that before you actually deploy so there are a lot of new concepts are coming from signing verification and the solar shield so things like that i think you should implement so there are many ways to combat and now all organizations should be on this in terms of how do we make sure there is no software supply chain risk and it's a difficult problem to solve it's not one or two ways to do that but we should get on things like this great points great point so um Kind of our last question in here, but I want to sort of very quickly throw out to you guys is, you know, what are the best practices every cybersecurity program should have? So we've talked about 
the process. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the program. So, and I'll start off with, you know, one of the things I, I, I tell people who, who don't have a program or are just starting out is, right, you should have an incident response program, uh, what we call PSER, Product Security Incident Response. And by the way, that is very different than a typical IT, you know, incident response or, or other types of incident response programs in your company. Um, the, the difference, probably the most significant, is that you're interacting with an external third party. Right, uh, could be um, uh, you know India Cert that we're here today. It could be any a number of different uh, researchers, and, and that's a very different type of conversation than hey, I've got a ticket, I, you know, my my server's down, and, and the whole relationship is important, and it's quite different. More of the point in larger context here is that you need to have a way for your customers and other people to tell you you have a problem, and if you don't have some sort of an instant process that's published and public, how would anyone know? So just a thought, have an incident response program. So Harish, what do you got? Uh, from my point, like security awareness is most important. Right now it's uh, a most important, I can say for every organization, we should have a security awareness program because, because like we are talking about the software security and developers Definitely, they don't have a security background from the beginning itself, but yes, they are learning, they are using the tools and all. So the awareness about the security across the organizations, including the developers, non-security guys, so it will aware them, okay, there's something going on in the world, so how you can prevent and how you can save yourself. Because in, like attacks happen, so like in, in, uh, in, in phishing, you can say that they, the targets the easy guys. So when you aware, when you send the, okay, Okay, this kind of phishing is happening. These are awareness you share with the organization employees. So they know, okay, these kind of things can happen in the organizations and they learn from them and they implement and they can save yourself and your organization as well. Great, great point. Gordo? Yeah, so I'm just going to talk about a program uh, which is well known, but there are, I think there it's again next gen, uh, defense in depth because today hackers are one step ahead. They're always probably, unless we think like them. So there is, uh, and they use a lot of different technologies, tools, and so on, and different methodologies that we haven't, we never try before we come to know from them, right? So there is no silver bullet for any technology for us to combat that or even one single layer. So that's why we need to have a multi-layer strategy for uh, defense. And it, it was there, just that I think the layers have increased and how you do that defense has, has changed. So right from the network layer, um, to the data, there are different uh, defense in depth you can do. You can have the network security at the uh, application layer, say when you can have WAF, web application security, then IDS, IPS, which is you have. Now, what has changed or what we should put more focus is now there is uh, the era has gone where network security was enough. Now the attacks have reached to the code, code level, right? So application security has become more important and that's why it should evolve and it should change and we should put more focus in terms of how we do application security. And there is a concept about not trusting every entity even in the same zone. So the concept about micro segmentation, right? Uh, lateral movement has to be stopped. So in a particular zone, when you have different entities, you have to trust each entity after you verify, though it is a software entity. You cannot trust same binary, uh, different binaries in the same zone. So lateral movement, micro segmentation, that is a new change in the defense in depth in a particular layer, which is the application layer, where you deploy different system components. Another layer is a data layer, because data is at core and now data becomes structured, unstructured, both. Structured data we are always used to protect in terms of databases or the directory servers that we use uh, with different levels of encryption. Unstructured data sometimes get unnoticed like your files and emails and um, uh, the shares that you have, the shared data, right? So there has to be focus for data protection for unstructured data as well because data is at the core. Hmm. And that defense is definitely required in terms of defense of depth. Other thing I just wanted to mention is we have to definitely go from detecting and responding to now with this behavioral patterns feedback loop from predicting and then protecting. And that's where we will become eff more efficient. Great. Avishak, take us home. What was the question again? Can you? Can you... <laughs> <laughs> so the question was really about 
what are the best practices a, a, a program should have? Is it application security program or? Yeah, security so, so you know, security architecture, that's okay. right. Yeah, okay. So uh, if I'm responsible for the defensive side of things, then uh, probably for me, the most important bit is don't get hacked, okay? So to do whatever is required to prevent the attackers. But uh, talking about that, uh, if you look at it, uh, there is a very famous saying. I think uh, I saw this some 12 years back in some conference is that uh, there's a quote. Defenders thinks in uh, list and attackers thinks in graph, right? If you just, just, you know, recollect what all things we have been discussing, right? We have been discussing lists, this, 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 this. Attackers will not care any of that. Right? Attackers will discover, disc uh, try to discover everything that you have. From their experience and their expertise, they will find the attack surface where, which is most important or where they have the most expertise. Doesn't matter whether, where it comes into the defender's priority and they'll just use that. Right? So that's how it works. Attackers, that's why there is a saying attackers will always win. Because of this, uh, I would say information, uh, uh, you know, asymmetry between defenders. Defenders work is much more difficult. Attackers just need one attack surface and one area where they are good at. Defenders need to be good at everything and know about all the attack surface. Talking about attack surface, if I have to look at from that perspective, I would say, uh, you know, threat modeling or security architecture review is an important part of the overall security program, right? Mm -hmm. When you are building a system, before it, the, the engineering aspects of it starts, if there is a collaboration between the security team and the engineering architects, if it, if the security, if the architecture of the system is reviewed, a uh, formal threat modeling process is performed, m mostly you will identify a lot of threats very early in the SDLC, right? Whether that involves maybe slightly re-architecting the system to reduce attack surface. From my perspective, attack surface reduction is the most important bit. Great point. Your defense, as a defender, your job is extremely difficult trying to protect against every single attack surface. So as a goal, I would see how to reduce attack surface as much as possible. Great point. Well, we've got about uh, one or two more minutes and want to see if anybody had any questions. Go ahead. Hey, hi, this is Anil from Carrier uh, Corporation. So I just have one question where we are facing day-to-day uh, -day challenges. It's like uh, you are talking about the open source component which we are using. See, the problem is our product is in the market from last 10 years and we are consuming open source component very properly and we are doing all check from Black Duck. Now the problem is the components which we are consuming have not been updated from last two, four, five, five years on the GitHub repo. Now we left with two options. Either we download and, and develop that particular open source component and consume it, but there'll be a license challenge, there'll be a lot of things. Second thing is either we go for another open source component which is similar features, but that will impact a product which is already there on the field. So wanted to see what is your opinion on that. <laughs> so uh, this is the exact reason why I said supply chain security is very complex. So uh, just by running dependency check or black duck and all these things, it's not enough. The problem that you are facing, if most organizations are facing. This is the unmaintained software. You are dependent on external components which are not maintained anymore. So uh, in some cases, if you are lucky, if it's some very popular component, there can be some organizations who commercially maintains that. But in other cases, I, from what I understand or based on my experience, there is no other way but have a strategy to either replace that component with internally developed behavior, similar behavior, or replace that with a more uh, mature software component. This is exactly the reason why supply chain security is not just about vulnerability. It's also about having the control where you can vulnerability or vulnerability is just one of the attributes. If you can somehow uh, detect and deny the inflow of third party components which are not approved as per your security policy. For example, as a developer, it is easier for me, it is the path of least friction for me to find a library which does my job today. I will not care whether that library will, main, will be maintained three years or five years down the line. But as the security team, if you have that right set of controls and if you can deny 
that if a software component is not matured enough or if it is not supported by say any of the major open source bodies like say uh, Apache Software Foundation or maybe Google or some of those well maintained libraries then those are not approved or maybe you can look at a case to case basis look at it and approve. Once it goes inside it is extremely difficult to remove it. It has a major impact. Great. So with that, I think we're, we're kind of at time. And um, what I would say, we're, we're going to stick around. So if you guys have any questions, come up and, and talk to us. Um, I, again, want to thank everybody for coming out and, and seeing our, our session. And again, thank you all panels for, for coming out. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>